And Shai, if you want to share your slides. Sure, yes. Um, okay. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, okay so next we have uh, Shai Moran from the Technion who is going to tell us about the equivalence between private prediction and online classification. Okay, yes, uh, so thank you for the, for the invitation. So I guess I have 45 minutes, which means, okay, good, I'll just take time. Okay, so yes, yeah, so hello to everyone and um, I'll talk today about a few papers actually, and this is joint work with um, Mariante Maliaris, Noga Alon, Roy Livni, and Mark Ban, whose pictures you can see. And maybe before we start, just an, uh, a comment is that the way this uh, this idea that led to this work was uh, was conceived was via results in model theory, actually that uh, Mariante introduced. Uh, uh, to us. So this is just a kind of, a, uh, I don't know, non-standard uh, way of uh, getting results in computer science. Okay, so yeah, so, so this talk is about differentially private learning. So, uh, so private machine learning, what is it, when is it relevant? So, um, so one example which we'll use throughout this talk is that imagine that you have a deep neural doctor Okay, and then uh, uh, you, so your family doctor comes to you one day and asks you to share your medical record to train a deep neural doctor. And of course, uh, most people may want to help, but also some of them may be afraid that this can cause a terrible event because it is personal and sometimes sensitive data whose uh, exposure may, may cause some bad events. Um, and this is indeed like a not only a third example, but this is a real world uh, issue uh, of more uh, learning algorithms using personal and sensitive data. And therefore it is a, a relevant problem to study. So the TLDR version of our main result is that, so the, the question we ask is which tasks can be learned while protecting private data. And the answer is that any task which is online learnable and I'll soon give all the necessary definitions, but let me just mention that online learning is kind of a mature area, which has been studied for, for several decades, while private um, machine learning is, is a young area. So the definition of, of differential privacy is just maybe 15 years old. And the first uh, paper in, in private uh, machine learning was probably 2010 or something like that, so 10 years ago. Um, okay, and then let me know that uh, while this gives like a kind of a general uh, abstract result, it manifests connections that were uh, previously uh, noticed and, uh, and exploited. And yeah, so there are some results that, you know, notice that whenever you have an online learning algorithm, in many cases, it is automatically differentially private. And also there are some works in the opposite direction where where they use differential privacy to, to design online algorithms with, with excellent guarantees. So, yeah, so uh, we just give kind of a formal and abstract uh, manifestation of these connections. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start to discuss some formal uh, definitions. So formally what we prove is that private path learning is equivalent to online learning and let me quickly define these, uh, these models. So uh, yeah, so the pack learning setting, as I suppose most of you know, so we assume there is a class of Boolean functions from a domain X. There is some unknown distribution over examples that we wish to learn. And we assume that uh, this, uh, the, the target function, the labeling function is a concept from the class, is a function from this, uh, from this class. And we get a, a training sample uh, from this distribution. And the goal is to output a function f, which is close to the, to the target uh, concept with, uh, with respect to the metric induced by the distribution. 
Okay, so this is just the standard definition of back learning. And uh, we say that a class H is back learnable if there exists an algorithm whose population loss vanish with the number of examples. As the number of examples goes to infinity, the, the population loss of the algorithm goes to zero, and this should uh, happen in a uniform rate over all possible distributions D. Uh, yeah, okay. So that was the PAC learning part. What is the private part? How, we do, how do we define mathematically private uh, uh, privacy? So, um, so again, let's go back to, to our definition, to our, uh, to our example. So we have this, uh, this um, doctor who wants to use our data to, to train a Duke neur neural doctor and, um, and the patient wants to contribute, but afraid that this will cause a terrible event E. So what differential privacy allows the doctor to say, allows the scientist to, to say to the patient is that whatever event E that you're afraid of, the likelihood of this event will not be affected by the decision, by your decision to participate or not. More formally, the likelihood of all events remain almost the same when adding, removing a single data point. Okay, so, so, so that's the definition of privacy. Soon we'll give the, 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 the quantified version, but, but, but this is the, the, the essence of it. So any particular person, whether they contribute their data or not, will not affect the likelihood of any future event um, uh, which is resulting by this experiment, by this, uh, by the training. So this is a, a strong form of stability, as you can see. Okay, so now let's define it formally. So, um, so we will need the following notation. <clears throat> so for two numbers, uh, so, so so fixed epsilon and delta in zero one. These are the privacy parameters. So let us denote that um, x and y are equal up to epsilon delta if x is at most e to the epsilon times y plus delta and vice versa, and y is at most e to the epsilon times x plus delta. So if we remember that e to the epsilon is roughly one plus epsilon, then we see that up to an affine transformation, which is almost the identity, x and y are the same number. And now we say the two distributions, p and q, are epsilon delta indistinguishable if for every event e, the probabilities, the measures p of e and q of e, or epsilon delta equal to each other. Okay, so with this notation, we can define what when is an algorithm differentially private. Um, so, um, so assume A is a randomized algorithm. I want to define when is A differentially private. So, um, so in our case, the algorithm get an input sample. So it's a sequence of examples and it outputs are an hypothesis but it's a really a randomized hypothesis because we assume the algorithm is randomized. So we can think of A of S as a distribution over hypothesis, uh, where the distribution depends on the random bits of the algorithm A. Okay, so we say that A is epsilon delta differentially private if for every pair of neighboring samples, S and S prime, so for every pair of input samples, they disagree on a sim single example, so they are all the same except for a single example, we have that the distributions over the output, A of S and A of S prime are indistinguishable, are epsilon delta indistinguishable. This is exactly what we, what we said informally before. So every, the likelihood of every event will not change by much if we just change a, a single example. And let me just know that epsilon is, a, is usually taken to be a constant. So let's say 0 0.1, while delta should be negligible uh, with M comparing to one over M. Okay, so these are the, the standard um, setting of parameters. Okay, um, and now, when do we say that uh, a class is learnable in a differentially private way? So first of all, it has to be PAC learnable, but then we also require that the learning algorithm that learns it is differentially private. Okay, so this is a differentially private PAC learnability. 
by the way, if there are any questions, please, uh, please interrupt me. And I feel like I'm talking to myself. Um, You're not alone. It's okay. Okay, good. We're good. listening. <laughs> so, okay. A quick question. Um, so, A of S is a multi-output function, right? No, A of S is a so A is a random. Any, whenever you have a randomized algorithm, once you give it an input, you have, you get a distribution over outputs. And the, each output is a vector, or is it a single? In our context, each output is just a, is an, an hypothesis, right? It's a function. Okay. But we we have learned algorithms, so they get input samples as inputs, mm -hmm. and they produce uh, Boolean functions as outputs. Okay. So we have such a randomized algorithm. The input is is a sample. The output is an hypothesis. But since the algorithm is randomized, mm -hmm. we we view the output as a distribution of hypotheses. Right. Okay. 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 And then the differential privacy means that whenever you change the input in one point, these these output distributions remain roughly the same. Right. In this uh, in this precise sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, so again, differentially private learnability is just path learnability by a DP algorithm. Okay, so we defined the left-hand side of the equivalence. Now let's let's view the, the, the model for the right-hand side. So this is a online learning in the binary label case. So again, as before, we have a class of binary functions. Uh, and now we look at this online learning model, uh, which proceeds in T, capital T iterations. In each iteration, our algorithm receives a question, which is just an, uh, an instance in, in, in the domain. Then it predicts an answer, a label in plus minus one. Then it receives the true answer, uh, which is also in plus minus one. And it suffers a loss if the predicted label is is different from the from the true label. So if it made made a mistake. And <clears throat> the goal is to minimize the uh, the regret, what we call the regret. So the regret is the total number of mistakes made by the algorithm, comparing to the total number of mistakes made by the best function in the class capital H. In particular, one interesting uh, setting is when there exists a function in the class that makes no mistakes, i.e. when this infimum is zero. And then we just want to minimize the number of mistakes. Okay, so, um, so there is no distribution now over examples. We, there is an, uh, an adversary, if you will, that asks us these questions and reveals us these labels. And our goal is to make as few mistakes as possible where the comparator class is again this class H of Boolean functions. Okay, so um, so what when when do we say that a class of uh, H, the class H is online learnable? So the definition here, if there exists an algorithm that can learn it, so against any adversarially produced sequence, it can learn it with, uh, with uh, sublinear regret. So the total number of mistakes will only exceed the best function in class by some sublinear function. Okay. And the, let me let me stress that the input sequence here is adversarial, so it's not stochastic like in the pack setting. It's it, it can be arbitrary. And let me also notice. Um, just so I can ask you some open questions, that it is captured by a combinatorial parameter called the Lilson dimension, which we will define later. But for now, just know that there is this uh, combinatorial parameter that is assigned to the class H. It is similar to the Vichy dimension, for those of you who know. And this, the finiteness of this parameter determines the only learnability. And furthermore, the, this function, the optimal regret bound, is also determined by this. Um, by this combinatorial parameter. Okay, so that's it. We defined what when is a class privately packed learnable, and we defined when is a class online learnable. And now we're going to say that that every class satisfies is privately packed learnable if and only if it is online learnable. Yeah, so this is the main result. So the following uh, are equivalent for any class H. 
of uh, Boolean functions. So H can be learned in a differentially private uh, manner in the fact setting. H can be online learned. And the third item is the H has this finite Lewiston dimension, which I still haven't defined, but for now we remember it's just a, a combinatorial parameter assigned to the class. Um, yes, and as, as we will discuss soon, uh, the proof is really based on a combinatorial perspective of learning. And also we introduce a new notion of algorithmic stability, which may be of independent interest. We will discuss all of this soon. Uh, for now, let me just tell you quickly about, uh, about uh, an immediate application that we have, that we have, uh, that we can, so, you know, every class that we know is only learnable uh, is also differentially private back learnable. So of course, this includes all uh, finite classes, but this was already known that uh, this, that finite classes are differentially private uh, back learnable. But there are also some interesting examples of infinite classes that are only learnable and henceforth are also uh, private back learnable. So you can take humming balls over an infinite domain, take affine subspaces of, of, any, of any vector space, uh, more general uh, solutions to, to systems of polynomial equalities, not inequalities, but equalities. So uh, like uh, the varieties uh, that uh, Daniel uh, mentioned before, half spaces with margin. And there are many, many, many more examples from model theory. So it, it turns out, and this is the connection to model theory that uh, this uh, Nilsson dimension is, uh, um, is it, it's like a, it's a very important parameter there and it defines what they call stable theories. And there are many, many examples for stable theories and any class which is definable in a stable theory has finite Lipson dimension. So this gives you many examples which maybe are esoteric in machine learning but mathematically very rich. Okay. And uh, before we go into the technical uh, so for a, short, for a short technical overview, let me just mention one open question. So although we prove this equivalence, the, the equivalence is really only qualitative, at least what we proved. In particular, the lower bound on the sample complexity of private back learning scales with log star of the Lipson dimension. Okay, so it is very, very small. And the upper bound that we proved is exponential in the Lilson dimension. And this was just improved, I think, a week ago by uh, Ghazi, Golovich, Kumar, and Banuangsi to d to the sixth or something like this. So it's probably not the right answer, but it's a, a very a significant improvement over our exponential upper bound. Um, but in any case, even polynomial in D is still very, very, very far away from log star D. Um, and, and we know that log star D is sometimes almost tight. So there are examples of classes with fields to mention uh, D that can be learned in poly log star D, number of examples, but this can potentially be completely avoided. Uh, and and I guess uh, one conjecture that uh, that I can state is that the sample complexity is really polynomial in the VC dimension. So VC dimension is back learning without any restrictions, and in the log star of the Lilson dimension. If this conjecture is true, it means that the Lilson dimension only has a very very negligible uh, effect on the sample complexity. And this conjecture is uh, supported by a line of work for uh, of works for deep learning half spaces. Okay, so uh, there are some reasons to believe this conjecture, but uh, yeah, it, it is it is wide open. Um, is it known yeah, to be false without the log star dependence on the or some dependence on the little stone dimension? Again, again, is it known that? Uh, is it some dependence on the little stone dimension necessary? Yeah, so this is this is our uh, result, right? So the sample complexity is always at least log star of the little stone dimension. Okay. And it's, it's a, 
for differentially private back learning. Yeah, yeah, this is for differentially private back learning. Okay, so so we know that the sample complexity is finite if and only if the Lewis dimension is finite, right? This is what this this inequalities tell you. Mm -hmm. But how finite, we have no idea. And it could be, as far as we know, that it's really the, the, the it, you know, it's very, very mild dependence of log star. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, do a quick technical overview, and then I'll ask some more open questions in the end if I have time. Okay, so um, as I said, the equivalence is qualitative. It's based on a combinatorial perspective and a new notion of uh, algorithmic stability. Um, so really, so let's talk a little bit about the combinatorics in the proof. So first of all, uh, for the context, let me just mention that, you know, there is a, so combinatorial parameters really are often, often arise in, in machine learning, in, in learning complexities. So probably the most famous one is back learning versus the VC dimension. And then there is what we mentioned, the online learning and listen dimension, but there are many other examples. Um, essentially, whenever you have a min max uh, statistical problem, my, my experience is that there is a combinatorial parameter behind it that uh, that captures the learnable objects. Um, okay, so let's discuss these two uh, important examples of VC dimension and Lisson dimension. And now I will also define what this Lisson dimension is. So first, let's uh, recall the definition of the VC dimension. So the VC dimension of, of a class H is the maximum size of a set, which is shattered by H, right? So we, we want, when is a set, when is a subset of the domain shattered by H? It is shattered by H when you have, when you restrict H to this uh, X1 up to XD to these points, then you see all possible uh, two to the D binary patterns. Uh, another way to think about it is, is um, and this way is useful for defining Lisson dimension, is that you have a binary tree. At the root, you have x1. The second level is labeled by x2. The third level by x3, and so on. And uh, and if we think of it as a decision tree, so the VC dimension, so this set is shattered if and only if every path in this decision tree is realized by some function in H. Okay, so we have this tree, x1 labeled the root, x2 the second level, x3 the third level, and so on. If every path is realized by some function in H, then this amounts to this set being shattered. And really the VC dimension is the deepest such, it's the depth of the deepest such tree, which is shattered by H. Okay, um, I hope this is clear. So what is the Lilson dimension? Lilson dimension is the same thing only that we don't require the tree to have the same label over the over over each level right so now we allow that uh, at the same level you'll have different labels so for instance here the root is labeled x1 and the second level is labeled x2 and x3 so it's not the same variable and so on and so forth so the least dimension of h is the maximum size of a complete binary tree, which is shattered by the class H. Okay, so in particular, it can be much deeper than the VC dimension because we don't require the labels to be the same. Does it make sense, the definition? So here you mean size and not depth of the tree? Depth, depth, also depth. depth. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, this is a, this is a, uh, yeah, it's a depth, it's the depth of the tree. Got it, Sorry, thanks. This is a typo. Okay. And let's see an example where the two, where the real dimension is much, much deeper than the VC dimension. Uh, so consider uh, thresholds, okay? So one dimensional threshold function, right? So all indicators of thresholds in RT, all half lines in, in R1 in, in the, on the real line. Okay, so the VC dimension is only one here because um, 
we never we, we never we can never shatter uh, a set of two points because we can never see in this example uh, I guess zero and then one. But if you look at this binary search tree, which we can continue indefinitely, it is shattered by this class, right? It's a, right? It just tells us in this binary search essentially looks for the threshold. Um, okay. So this is for, yeah, so this, so this is an example where there's two, where the, where, you know, when the visit dimension is one, but the listener dimension is really infinity. Uh, okay, so now for, so the VC dimension, as I, I, I suppose uh, most of you know, characterizes pack learnability. So a class H is learnable without any privacy restrictions, uh, just in the classical sense, if and only if it has a finite VC dimension, D, and moreover, the VC dimension captures the sample complexity of, of pack learning up to log factors. Um, okay, and for Lidstone dimension, uh, we have the same result only when we replace pack learning by online learning. So uh, class H is only learnable if and only if it has a finite Lidstone dimension. And furthermore, we have the same kind of characterization of the regret bounds. Um, okay. So by this result, it suffices to show that differentially private learning is possible if and only if the Lidstone dimension is finite, right? We don't have to think about uh, really about on and learning algorithms. We can just work with this combinatorial parameter. Um, although one direction in the proof will use online learning. Okay. So yeah, so we proved these two directions in two different papers. So the first uh, direction that if the differentially if if the pack is differentially private learnable, then the list dimension is finite was in the first paper, and then this year we prove the converse. Um, let's begin with the first direction that any class that is private pack learnable must have a, list, a finite list on dimension. So really, what we will prove will be the converse. So we will show that if the list on dimension is unbounded then the class cannot be differentially private pack learnable. And I want to just quickly discuss in a non-technical uh, fashion, two central ideas in the proof. Um, so the first one is that it suffices to focus on one dimensional thresholds. And the second one is, uh, is that one has to detect hard distributions here in a non-standard way. And the way we do it is via Ramsey theory. So let, let's discuss these two points now. Uh, so for the first point, actually there is also a nice open question related to it. But first I want to define, to give a definition. So what is the threshold dimension of a class of functions? So the threshold dimension of a class of function H we denote it but by T dim of H, is the maximal integer K such that we can find X1 up to XK and H1 up to HK. So we can find K points and K functions such that HI of XJ is one if and only if I is greater or equal than J. Okay, so really if you look at the metrics, at the Boolean metrics, the incidence metrics of these points and functions, you really get this uh, triangular matrix. Okay, so the threshold dimension is the maximum K such that we can find the triangular matrix in the incidence matrix of the class. Um, yeah, so really what it means is that the class contains a subclass of K thresholds, right? And this is the maximal subclass of thresholds you can find in there. And just a comment is that this can be thought of as a combinatorial uh, uh, generalization of the of margin. Margin is a geometric concept in the context of half spaces. Um, okay, so here is a theorem that um, 
that we did not know about, and this is something that Marianne told us. Uh, it, it was known for model theorists since uh, since the 70s. Um, but here is but but it's a very interesting uh, interesting result. So it turns out that for every class H, the Lipson dimension and the threshold dimension they have this exponential um, at most can exponential uh, dependent between them. So the Lipson dimension is bounded is upper bounded by two to the threshold dimension and is lower bounded by the lo log of the threshold dimension. Okay, so, um, and and by the way, uh, uh, this is the open question I wanted to note. So this is tight. So we know of examples, actually the examples of one dimensional thresholds, uh, they, they uh, satisfy this inequality with an equality. So just have thresholds over one to n, but here we don't know whether it's tight. So we know that uh, there's always an inequality, but maybe it can be improved. Um, okay. And again, if we think about the margin comment from before, then this really kind of, so if, since the Lewis dimension captures online learning, the mistake bound. So we see that this connection between the threshold dimension and mistake bound can be seen as a, again a, an abstract extension of the mistake bound margin connection for half spaces. Uh, so with enough imagination, you can you can um, make this analogy. But really, the takeaway message in the context of uh, of our uh, of our paper is that if the Lipson dimension is large, then H contains a large subclass of thresholds. Right. So whenever the Lipson dimension is very big then we can find the witness for it in the form of, of many thresholds of, 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 uh, in, the, in this class. Any questions about this? This is, um, okay. Okay. So it suffices to show that the class of thresholds over some large domain is not privately learnable. Right, this is the takeaway. We, 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 as we said, we wanted to prove the converse that if the Lilson dimension is large and the class is not privately learnable, but we know by this result that if the Lilson dimension is large, then there are also many, many thresholds in the class. I actually, there is a question by Ashwin. Let me just allow him to talk. Okay. Ashwin, you can ask your question. Um, yeah, just a quick question about the upper bound. So you said it's not tight and, and something is open. So what is known in terms of a tight upper bound, like something we know is achievable? Not much. We, we thought about it for, for some time and uh, I think we have some, um, yeah, anyways, not much, like very, very weak uh, bounds we have. It's not exactly stated in this form, um, but, uh, but really nothing is known. Uh, All right. Essentially nothing is known. So if you if you consider like actual threshold functions up to a certain uh, uh, you know level of granularity, then it's a case where the little stone dimension is equal to the threshold dimension. Okay, so if you take thresholds up to from one to n, okay, then yeah. you can have a bin binary then you exactly. can have a binary yeah. then you can have a binary mm -hmm. search tree of depth log n. So the little yeah. stone dimension. Is um, uh, is going to be log n, and the threshold dimension is going to be n. Okay, so it's tied for the lower bound. Yes, exactly. Cool. But for the upper bound, we don't know. Okay. So yeah. So again, so we want to show that a uh, class with unbounded Lipson dimension is unlearnable, is not privately learnable. So in this class, we identify many thresholds and we just focus on thresholds. Okay, so previous results for this context, in this context show that proper private learning is impossible for thresholds. And also that it's impossible to learn thresholds if we insist on pure differential privacy, which just means that the delta parameter, if you remember in the epsilon delta privacy is set to zero. 
but it remained open since uh, 15, so for almost five years, it was open whether you can, um, you can do anything better. Um, okay, so, so how to prove the, a lower bound for threshold? So again, the goal is to show that every differentially private algorithm A cannot learn thresholds. So we need to find a hard distribution D for A, right? We have a, an algorithm A that is differentially private. We need to find a distribution which witnesses this A does not learn threshold. Typically in, um, in, 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 in machine learning and more generally in computer science, we do it by a minimax approach. Okay, so we find a single hard distribution which is hard for all algorithms. Yeah, construct a single D, which is hard for all algorithms. So for example, in, in the pack setting, if you take a distribution over a shattered set, and this is how you prove that the VC, uh, lower bound of VC dimension for pack learning. So it's a single hard distribution over a shattered set. The interesting and challenging fact here is that this cannot work. If the marginal distribution is known, then the thresholds and in fact, every VC class is pack learnable. Okay, if the marginal distribution, not the target function, only the marginal distribution is known, then every VC class can be pack learnable. And the idea is very simple. You just uh, pick a finite cover for the class. So uh, you can cover the class with respect to the metric induced by the distribution, the disagreement, uh, the measure of disagreement between functions. And, and then you can learn a finite class using the exponential mechanism in a differentially private way. So, so really uh, we cannot uh, use this. We cannot, uh, we, we cannot hope to construct a single marginal distribution which witnesses that thresholds are not privately learnable. So we must tailor D in a way that depends on the algorithm A. And the challenge is that A is really an arbitrary learning algorithm. It may be improper. We, we really, there is not much we can use about A except the fact that it is a mapping from samples to hypothesis. What can we possibly use to construct this distribution D? So the, the idea is to use Ramsey theory. So I will soon state what Ramsey theorem says, but let me just uh, know that Ramsey theory will allow us to detect in an algorithm dependent way. So given an algorithm A, I will be able to detect a, a large subset X prime of the domain, such that if we only give A inputs from X prime, then the behavior of the algorithm on this set is very, very predictable. It's highly regular. We can control it and then we can exploit it to prove a lower bound. So this is the high level idea. So again, like the usual uh, minimax kind of approach that we usually see is replaced by a Ramsey theory or by Ramsey theorem, which, uh, which gives you, uh, which tailors actually a hard distribution in an algorithm dependent way. Um, yeah, and yeah, so D is going to be uniform on X prime on this large set on which A is highly regular. Will you say what you mean by highly regular? And I mean, will you explain this a bit more? Um, I didn't plan to. I plan to just state Ramsey theorem, but, but I can say a few words on this. Uh, so, yeah, so highly regular means that so if you remember, um, we talk about like the class is threshold, right? So X, X, the domain X is linearly ordered. Every pair of elements in X, these are just real numbers, you can compare them. Yes. The behavior of A is highly regular means that A is comparison based. It can only use, use comparisons to, in, in, when it access the, accesses the input. Okay. So this is what highly regular means, and it's not exactly accurate, but it's but uh, let's say it's uh, it's uh, but this is the idea. Yeah. So so essentially, what Ramsey theory tells you is that you can only restrict yourself to comparison-based learning algorithms, and comparison-based learning algorithms are much easier to handle. Okay. So right. So comparison-based means that if you get two samples. Um, 
then the output of the algorithm really only depends on the kind of the other type of the of the sample and not um but yeah I'm, I'm not going to say more so so regular means that the algorithm is comparison based this is um this is precise enough okay i don't know if it helps but uh, <laughs> but but at least maybe you can believe that comparison based algorithm are uh, are, are, are very are much easier to understand than arbitrary algorithms that may use the you know the whether the number is rational or not for instance sure okay okay so ramsey theorem um, um yeah so it's you know ramsey theory is a philosophy by now but uh, but the original theorem um so yeah, so that maybe the, 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 the version that, that everyone learned is that whenever you have a group of six people, then you can either find in it three mutual friends or three mutual strangers. So if you have a, a graph on six points and, and every edge in this graph you color in one of two colors, red or green, then you can either find a, a uh, green rectangle, a uh, green triangle, or a red triangle. Here you can find both. Here is a red triangle. Um, more generally, whenever you have a, a ground set uh, T and you color all n tuples of T using the K colors, right? So here, for instance, n is a three. So this triplet is red. This triplet is purple, this triplet is green, and so on. Then Ramsey's theorem tells you that you can that there is a finite uh, lower bound R, which depends only on n, m, and k, such that whenever you, the domain is larger than, than R, then you can always find a monochromatic set of size m. And the monochromatic set is just a set where all the uh, where all tuples of, of S have the same color. Um, and what we do is we, we take the, the algorithm and if the algorithm uses M examples to learn, then we, we color all M tuples of the domain in, in a very particular way. And then from the homogenic set, from the monochromatic set, which is given to us by Ramsey theorem. Uh, th this is the, 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 the set X prime on which the algorithm is regular. So yeah, so again, this is really just a rough overview. I hope it, it gives you something. And let me just comment that the most technical part, which is also quite short, is after the application of Ramsey. So it's to derive the lower bound with respect to the uh, comparison based algorithm, if you will. So to the regular algorithm. Okay, so any, any questions about this um, about this part? Okay, so let's see how much. Actually, how much time do I have, Seb? If any? Sorry, 10, like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes? Ah, I still have 15 minutes, good, okay, I wasn't sure. Yeah. Great, great, awesome. Okay, so we're done with the with the first direction. Let me now uh, say a few words about the second direction that whenever the Lewis dimension is bounded, then there actually is a private pack learner, right? So that online learning implies private pack learning. Okay. So the proof has two steps. The first step, we will show that if the Lewis dimension is finite, or more, more precisely, if the class is online learnable, here we're really going to use online learning, then there is something we called we call a globally stable learner. And then from this globally stable learner, it will be quite uh, straightforward, or at least standard, to derive a differentially private learner. Um, so what is this? So, so as you can see, a, a, a central notion here is global stability, globally stable learner. Let me define what, what this is. So a learning algorithm A is globally stable if for every distribution D, 
there exists an hypothesis H, which depends only on the distribution D, such that whenever you apply A on random samples from D, on random inputs from D, then you will see H, the output will be this A, will be this hypothesis H, with bounded away from zero probability, with probability at least a constant which is bounded away from zero. Okay, so it means there exists a frequent hypothesis. So for every distribution D, there will be a frequent hypothesis that the algorithm will output. And if you think about it, it's, it's, it's similar, it, it, it resembles a variant of pseudo-deterministic algorithms, uh, which was defined by Gatt and Goldwasser. Right, so pseudo-deterministic algorithms are randomized algorithm whose um, such that the mapping they, they, they compute is almost deterministic, right? So for every input, there is a particular output that is outputted with high probability. So it's kind of a randomized algorithm that computes a deterministic map. And here it's, it's the same idea, but only in the learning setting. So for every distribution, there will be uh, a particular hypothesis, which is assigned to this distribution. Okay, and the reason we call it global, global stability, okay, let's, this maybe I'll do in the next slide. Shai, I, I, I messed up in terms of the time, I'm sorry. Oh, um, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe, yeah. maybe it would be good to wrap up actually, because uh, yeah, we're already over time. I'm really sorry about that. Okay, so... Um, okay, so let's... Uh, yeah, so, so let's just uh, wrap up. Let's see if there's anything short I can say. Yeah, so as we said, like the main result was that uh, differentially private path learnability and only learnability are equivalent. Um, yeah, and that the proof was is based on a combinatorial perspective and this global stability, which we didn't define, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, and I guess that's it. Yeah, the, the open questions will take a while. So let's... Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yes, so thank you. Thanks, Shai. Uh, sorry about that. Maybe we can have the slides online if people want to look at the open sure. questions. Of course, no problem. Perfect. Okay, so let's take a quick five minutes uh, break and then we will be back at 10.30 uh, for the talk by uh, Li Yang Ten. So let's take a five minutes break. Thanks again, Shai. Thank you.